Hello and welcome to the Visual Snow Initiative's 2022 Visual Snow Summit. Today you will meet two very dedicated doctors whose treatment protocol has changed and will continue to change many more lives around the world. But first, some context on how we got here. Five years ago, if you, a family member, or someone you knew had Visual Snow Syndrome, or VSS, the possibility of getting a proper diagnosis was extremely unlikely. The sudden onset of visual distortions led many to consult an eye specialist who naturally performed a series of tests. When these eye tests all came back normal, more in-depth testing was generally recommended with referrals to other physicians. This process was simply the result of well-intentioned doctors trying to obtain answers to help their patients. Hearing the words, your results are normal, from a physician will almost always spark relief for both the patient and their doctor. But unless you are born with VSS, the transition from a normal life to a post-VSS life was often made worse by a your results are normal diagnosis. There is no break from VSS symptoms. For many, it is a 24-7 battle with eyes open or closed. A definitive and proper diagnosis for VSS patients is essential. Their symptoms are very real and valid, and yet a lack of awareness and education for VSS within the medical community left many patients feeling discouraged and marginalized. VSS was clearly a misunderstood and under-recognized syndrome. Once thought to be rare, it's now estimated that VSS symptoms affect roughly 2 to 3% of the world's population, many of whom have had their quality of life negatively impacted by the condition. The anticipation and hope on behalf of the person with VSS for their doctor to identify and fix the problem is magnified with every passing day. But doctors were not taught about visual snow syndrome in medical school. Most had never heard of VSS, nor did they know how to diagnose it. As a result, physicians were unable to administer the appropriate testing for visual snow syndrome, and they were unable to treat their patients for VSS because no such effective methods existed. That was then. Today, we are here to talk about progress and a possible treatment. We know that VSS is a neurological syndrome that presents itself within a variety of unique and alarming visual and non-visual symptoms. The day I first got visual snow, I was staring at my computer and suddenly everything started spinning and it felt like a very extreme onset of vertigo. I was having a lot of migraines, trouble thinking, trouble remembering. We just didn't know what was wrong with me. All the things that I would kind of take for granted, like being able to go out and get my own mail out of the mailbox, uh, being able to drive myself places, all these very simple things were no longer options for me. It's like looking through a broken television. I tried a bunch of different neuro medications. Everything that I tried pretty much caused more trouble than it helped. When I first saw Dr. Sang, she had me do a variety of tests to understand exactly what my status was as far as my vision and my brain and my balance system. And I was so symptomatic at the time that I could only complete half of the test itself. As I started to see her more and more and do my exercises, I began to slowly notice positive changes. It's been uh, about two years since I started working with Dr. Sang. The progress is pretty remarkable, especially when I think about uh, how symptomatic I was when I first came to see her. Today, I would say my quality of life is very high. My results have been so positive and life-changing. Dr. Sang has a really great grasp on what visual snow is and that she'll continue to develop her treatments of people so that they can have positive results like me. My name is Brad Napier. I'm Kelsey's dad. I'm a retired otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon. Kelsey, in about July of 2019, was telling me that she was having a lot of visual problems, a lot of balance problems, uh, mental fatigue, brain fog, and I showed her uh, a picture of what people's vision looks like when they have 
migraines. And she goes, no, dad, that's not what it is. And I go, well, what is it like? And she said, it's like static. I typed in uh, visual static and boom, there it was. I looked at it under visual therapy. I looked under visual, uh, uh, you know, visual snow. And then somehow I found Terry Sang's name. Terry was just absolutely delightful. And after talking with her for a few minutes, I knew that I had to get Kelsey down to see her. And then from there, Dr. Sang gave uh, Kelsey a lot of visual exercises to perform. Over the course of a just a few months, maybe like two months, I noticed an improvement in Kelsey. She was starting to feel better. She was having less problems with uh, tinnitus, less problems with her balance. The time she spent with Dr. Sang was, was fantastic. The first thing I think that really helped Kelsey was to know that this thing that she was experiencing was something that other people were experiencing. It was this syndrome of visual snow and she's shown incredible progress over the last couple of years. Before we get to our speakers, we would like to mention the different visual symptoms that make up VSS. Snow-like dots across the entire field of vision, small floating objects or flashing lights, sensitivity to light known as photophobia, continuing to see an image after it's no longer in the field of vision known as palinopsia, seeing images within the eye itself, known as entopic phenomena, seeing other visual stimuli such as starburst halos and double vision, known as diplopia. Making an already difficult diagnosis even more confusing are the many non-visual symptoms. Ringing, humming, or buzzing sounds known as tinnitus. Feeling detached from yourself or depersonalization. Symptoms of anxiety and depression. Frequent migraines, brain fog, and confusion. Insomnia and other sleep-related issues. Tingling sensations in legs and arms accompanied by general pain throughout the body. Dizziness and nausea. Of the five human senses, sight is often considered the most important, allowing us to go, do, and be the person we want and enjoy our amazing world. Now imagine your sight was suddenly overwhelmed by thousands of tiny lights and dots that flickered 24-7, whether your eyes were open or closed. And every doctor you saw told you there was nothing wrong. For people with visual snow syndrome, this frustrating scenario is their daily reality. Having visual snow is like seeing through a TV with a very bad reception. The main symptoms are snow-like dots, after images, light sensitivity, and palinopsia. That can make daily activities very difficult for people with visual snow, because while you're just seeing this, they're seeing all this which can make them extra sensitive to visual stimuli in busy places. But it can have non-visual symptoms too, like ringing in the ears, feeling detached, and muscular pain. We now know that visual snow syndrome is a neurological condition, meaning it's not an eye problem, it's a brain problem. Since there's nothing wrong with the eye structure, standard tests are usually negative. That's why for those with visual snow, their best bet is to see a neuro-ophthalmologist, a brain eye specialist. They can help manage your condition while researchers work on developing treatments. So if you or a loved one has visual snow, or you're a medical professional interested in the diagnostic criteria, head to visualsnowinitiative.org for more information today. Awareness is key. Please help spread the word that visual snow does exist. I am DeAndre Jones and I'm 44 years old. After I developed visual snow, um, it was very stressful because looking in the nighttime, I could see um, static, um, I had trouble sleeping. After images, when I stare at um, bright, bright lights, after images would last long. I would try different um, uh, herbal treatments, um, but I still had those visual, those visual issues. So I was researching visual snow and uh, someone posted a link and I clicked on the link. Uh, we did a lot of tracking, 
um, during the treatment. What really started to really help me was when we started using the different color glasses, uh, the red and green glasses. The green glasses really helped a lot with the floaters. I'm not as sensitive as light as I used to be. Better quality of sleep as well. Um, everything has gotten a little bit better. Um, my vision at night is better. I would say give it a try um, because you have doctors that are researching the, the visual snow syndrome. And I think um, from my experience working with the doctors that my, my sight has improved, uh, don't give up hope. Uh, just keep trying and, and see if you can get as much help as you can. My name's Jocelyn Ibarra and I'm from Austin, Texas. On a scale of one to 10, my symptoms in the beginning were at a 10 in terms of anxiety, depression, insomnia, distress. I also developed after images. So you look at something for, you know, more than a few seconds, you see the negative after image of it. The therapy has been really helpful, being able to have someone validate the symptoms that I'm having. I feel like for me, the things that have helped me the most were the accommodation exercises. We use flippers during therapy to work on that accommodative system. I've seen a lot of improvements since the time that I started therapy. My vision is crisper, clearer. I would put my symptoms after treatment at a two to three. The results of the treatment have been lasting and I'm also continuing several exercises on my own. So I think with VS, there are a lot of unknowns. So I would say, don't be discouraged. There are so many unknowns with VS. It's something that's being researched now and it's really encouraging. I don't think that we can take that for granted. Over the years, the VSI has been contacted on numerous occasions with recommendations for treating visual snow syndrome. The VSI goes to great lengths to vet all reasonable claims that could improve the quality of life for those dealing with VSS. Unfortunately, although well-intentioned, the vast majority of these treatments or cures end up having helped only the individual suggesting a particular treatment. While we are happy that their VSS symptoms were reduced or went away, these recommendations would not help the VSS community at large. Then we followed up on another recommendation, the one we are here to talk about today. When the VSI team heard about Dr. Terry Sang's success in treating VSS, we were admittedly skeptical. The VSI had spent millions on research, education, and awareness with a firm understanding from the medical and scientific communities that there was simply no current effective treatment for VSS. It was only after the VSI had months of direct dialogue and correspondence with Dr. Sang that we realized the life-changing impact her VSS treatment produced. We were then able to speak directly to her patients with VSS and confirmed that after Dr. Sang's VSS treatment, there was a significant improvement in both visual and non-visual symptoms. In fact, many had returned to the quality of life that preceded their VSS. For the VSI, this information was quite compelling and something we did not expect to hear. Dr. Sang's treatment, however, did not work for everyone. It was towards the end of our discussion with Dr. Sang's patients that we heard about Dr. Charles Shilovsky, or Dr. S, in Texas. Dr. S had gained notoriety for successfully treating VSS in a baseball player. We reached out to Dr. S and asked him how he was treating the baseball player's VSS. We were surprised to learn that his methods of treating VSS were strikingly similar to Dr. Sang's. In addition, Dr. S's patients had the same positive results. We then asked a friend of the VSI's, Dr. Ed Boyden, who is a neuroscientist at MIT, if it was possible to somehow rewire the brain through some of Dr. Sang and Dr. S's visual techniques to alleviate VSS symptoms. Absolutely, he said. Dr. Boyden encouraged the VSI to continue to pursue Dr. Sang and Dr. S treatment protocol. The VSI was then able to bring together Dr. Sang and Dr. S. They began to collaborate on their VSS treatment methods and patients' outcomes. They developed and refined their respective VSS neurovision treatment into a new protocol to conduct a simultaneous VSS study in California and Texas.
The Visual Snow Initiative, in collaboration with Dr. Sang and Dr. S, successfully submitted their new Visual Snow protocol to WCG IRB. WCG IRB is recognized as the gold standard of human research protection and a trusted partner to more than 3,300 research institutions in the US. The sang shilovsky VSS study protocol was approved in September of 2020 and certified again in October 2021. Before we continue, a few words from Sierra Dom, who is the founder of the Visual Snow Initiative. Hi, everyone. I want to thank you all so much for joining us today, and not only for being in attendance, but for being there every step of the way and supporting our cause. We appreciate your efforts, and because of you, our team has made significant progress. We're happy to be sharing a valid treatment option for VSS patients with our worldwide audience today. I started the VSI because I didn't want anyone with visual snow to have to go through what I did bouncing around from doctor to doctor with no answers or hope, scared and frustrated. When I was told there were no solutions for VSS, I became determined to create them. And thanks to you, by working together, it's becoming a reality. We're making a positive and significant impact through awareness, education, and research for visual snow. We want to thank and acknowledge the visual snow community, VSI's worldwide supporters, as well as the many passionate and dedicated doctors, researchers, and scientists that we work with. Also, we want to give a special thanks to Brad Napier and his daughter Kelsey for their many insights and contributions to the VSI. When progress is made, we're excited to share it with you. And while the VSS treatment is not one size fits all, we still want to share any advancements and potential resources that may be helpful. The VSI continues to work with many doctors and universities from around the world. Today, we are highlighting two of them. Many patients with VSS have already reported experiencing significant symptom reduction and quality of life improvements using their protocol. We want to share their findings and methods with the VSS and medical communities so that they can learn more about this new treatment option and or implement it if they so choose. You will be hearing from two extraordinary doctors today, Dr. Sang and Dr. S, and I want to thank them for their passion and diligence. I have been asked many times if I have gone through their VSS treatment. I have not been able to due to COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. I personally can't wait for my treatment sessions with Dr. Sang and Dr. S, but the data from their year-long VSS study speaks for itself especially considering people's VSS usually experiences no change or fluctuates within a set range, patient accounts of relief and improvements are noteworthy, promising, and quite frankly, remarkable. Our progress is your progress. I have visual snow syndrome too, and I want you to know that you have a friend who understands you, and we're in this together. And my hope is your hope that their protocol for visual snow will be the first line of treatment, and that no individual or individual's family will ever leave a doctor's office having been diagnosed with VSS, but being told there's nothing you can do. It's my mission to eradicate the persistence of that scenario so many of us have to go through. There are incredible doctors out there who care about VSS patients and are making progress. And on that note, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Sang and Dr. Shidlovsky, who will explain the significance of their VSS study and what this means for VSS patients moving forward. Although it's not a cure, their treatment has already made a positive impact on many lives, and we hope it does for you too. My name is Nevea. I'm from Austin, Texas, and I'm 10 years old. Well, before I can remember the symptoms, it was like it was hard to go to sleep because of the visual snow. My name is Andrea Cooper. I'm from Austin, Texas, and I am the mother of Nevea. She was kind of always born with visual snow, uh, so it's something we didn't know she truly had until she was probably about five. Before the treatment, her life was really tough. The symptoms were a lot of anxiety, a lot of night terrors, and having a hard time in school, even though her IQ is, is really high. It's hard to go to sleep and things like reading, it's hard because sometimes it like covers up the words. 
Nobody knew what was going on. We went to several doctors until she actually got a diagnosis. And you just become super helpless as a mom. You're not sure where to go. You don't even have the name for it. So it was very, very hard. The first day that we walked into Dr. S office, I was so excited and just broke down into tears because finally I found a doctor that was willing to, to listen. So I was so excited that um, there was hope in that moment. Before I started the treatment, it was really bad. But after the treatment, now I can focus on what I'm reading and go to sleep. Life after treatment has been wonderful just to be able to see her smile again and um, be able to go to sleep. To be honest, I didn't really believe it worked because I was kind of skeptical too because the first treatment that I did didn't work. But then when I started it, then it slowly progressed and started to get better. To the visual snow community, I know that you probably feel alone, but Dr. S is rooting for you. He is fighting for you. Basically what I would say to the people that also have visual snow is to just like keep on trying. I know you probably tried every treatment that you possibly could, but this one is, is promising and it has hope. Dr. Sang and Dr. S are here today to present their methods and findings to the visual snow and medical communities. Dr. S has been active in neurodevelopmental optometry for most of his years in practice. He has developed and integrated many unique therapies that have helped thousands of children who have struggled in school due to vision problems, often seen in ADD, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, sensory processing disorders, as well as some of the classic vision problems related to focusing and visual perception issues. He works with several professional sports teams in the Dallas area, as well as weekend athletes on developing vision skills, and is the clinical director for the Special Olympics Opening Eyes program. Dr. Terry Sang has over 25 years of experience in the field of optometry. She taught at the Southern Californian College of Optometry prior to joining private practice. She subsequently opened her own private practice in Irvine, California, where she helps kids and adults of all ages for problems with the visual system beyond 2020. In addition to providing clinical care in her office, she was an investigator for several research studies looking at the effect of stem cell therapy as an application for retinitis pigmentosa, and a study looking at the application of a new low vision device for patients with macular degeneration. My name is Preeti. I'm 27 years old. Before I started the study, it was like living in a nightmare. It was a struggle in any sort of lighting condition. And even when I closed my eyes, like I couldn't rest, I couldn't sleep, and it was exhausting. I honestly didn't know if I could go on living with how overwhelming my symptoms were. I found Dr. S on the VSI website. I did treatments once a week for 12 weeks. Uh, and some of the exercises that my therapist and I worked on were like near far focusing, um, vestibular exercises, uh, tracking objects. And I also found that I slept a lot better when we did the colored light therapy glasses. The outcome of the treatment is that I feel fully functional again. Don't have any dizziness. I can wake up and work a full day. I can spend time with my family. I pretty much feel like I did before I had VSS. There's a light at the end of the tunnel and it will get better. Dr. Sang and Dr. S, can you please describe your experience of treating your VSS patients before the study began? So many moons ago, around the time of the very first VSS conference, there was a patient who had made his way to the conference and at the end of one of the presentations, went up to Dr. Pellick to ask for some advice because he was really suffering and wanted to know if there was anything he could do. And at the time, she said, really at the moment, there's not really not very much, but perhaps you might try doing some filters. And since you're in Southern California, there's a doctor named Dr. Kammer who's very good with filters. So he made his way to her office, which happened to be my office, and um, went to see her first. Shortly thereafter, she knocked on my door and said to me, you know, is there anything you can do perhaps for this young guy? Because he's very young, he's very healthy, 
His visual acuity is 20-20, and she is a low vision doctor, and low vision doctors really deal with patients whose visual acuity is certainly worse than 20-20. But she said, really, he's in such visual distress, and I'm not sure if the filters are gonna be enough. She knew that I did lots of interesting work with lots of different kinds of patients and was just wondering if there's anything potentially that I could do to help this young guy. So he had come from quite far away, so I squeezed him to the schedule and I did my assessment. And at that time, I recognized that his symptoms and his issues, there was enough parallel with the way, with my patients who have had traumatic brain injury or mild traumatic brain injury, that I decided that if he was open to trying some new things, that I would be open to trying some new things as well. When I first met him, he was in such distress. He really was at a place where there was, no one had, there was, no one had given me any other options. There was no other treatment, there was no other plan. So he really was like, if you have something to offer, there's nothing else that I can do but try. And after several months of therapy, it was surprising and delightful to see the changes that he made. And one day he said to me, um, I think I'm moving out of state because his visual system had recovered to such a place that he could apply for a job. He got the job he wanted and he eventually moved away. So this is how it started for me. He subsequently went online to share his story. And from that sharing is how I met Kelsey. And from Kelsey, she reached out to VSI. And then from that discussion, VSI reached out to me. So that's how I got here today. Well, I had a story that was pretty much similar. I have heard visual snow symptoms from patients over the years. Um, we didn't have a name for it though. And now, and now uh, I had a patient who came in who was a baseball player, uh, was a college baseball player, pretty high level. And he couldn't play baseball for the last, last year and a half. And uh, he was distressed. His mother was distressed over the whole situation. And uh, they actually got referred to my office by uh, their physician. And ultimately, uh, and they had, they had consulted people all over the world about this visual snow. They had received the diagnosis prior. So this was my first diagnosed case of visual snow that came to my office. But when I was talking to him, I said, you know, I've heard these symptoms over the years. So then we dug into his history a little bit. And, um, and I, was, I was trying to figure out, well, what led on to this sudden onset of visual snow? And what I found out is a few weeks prior, he was sliding into third base. He had banged his head, uh, had a headache for a day, had a little bit of stars, you know, how you see stars after your injury like that. But after a day, it was gone. But about two weeks later, the symptoms started. So I said, you know, you may have had a very mild concussion and, and that may be what led into these symptoms. So I brought up to him that the fact that I had heard these symptoms over the years. So as Dr. Sang said, uh, what we really needed to do is we needed to kind of figure out where we needed to go with him as an individual um, to, to improve his symptoms. And I too kind of treated it like he had a concussion. Uh, and I think that was really an important step forward. So uh, we went through the whole training process with him over, over summer. And what we found out is he starts after about the fourth or fifth session, he started really improving and he started really noticing a difference. As, as we went further with it, uh, we, we, the skills continued to improve and we were really, really excited. But then the summer ended, he had to go back to school. And ultimately what happened was he went back to school, went back to playing baseball for the first time in a year and a half, which was very exciting to him. And I didn't really hear from them until about April of 2020. And everyone knows what happened in March of 2020, okay? We kind of hit COVID. And what ended up happening is the, um, the conference he played for wrote an article about him uh, because he was leading the league in hitting that year and how about his comeback into baseball. And two news stations in South Carolina picked up on that uh, article. Then ultimately a, a station in Oklahoma City picked it up and then ESPN, you picked it up and finally Sports Illustrated wrote an article about him. And that was really, really exciting. And once the Sports Illustrated article happened, then my phone started ringing and on the other end of the phone was, was Paul Dome. And he was asking about what we did. And that's kind of how I got there. And 
Uh, I detailed the treatment protocol to him that we utilized. And he said, you know, we've been talking to this doctor out in Southern California and she's using a very, very similar treatment. So he says, why don't you call her? So I picked up the phone, Terry and I, I had a great conversation and we, we really realized that we were kind of really almost on the same page as far as how we went about our treatment. And I said, what do we do now? Um, and I, I said, maybe we should kind of uh, put together a little study about this. And Terry says, well, we have to do it the right way. And she said, let's do an IRB study. So I said, I know nothing about this. I'm not a researcher, but let's, let's look into this. And so we did the legwork um, and came up with the IRB study. And, but I think the real important point here is that neither of us really had any real experience as principal investigators on a, on a research study. And we realized that our protocols and methods that we treated our patients with was largely based on protocols that we used with our patients who had suffered uh, mild traumatic brain injury, concussion, acquired brain injury, et cetera. And so we realized that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel with our, VS, with our snow patients, but we could build on the protocols that we had already established. Um, all of the protocols that we had largely established really came from our understanding of the anatomical structure of the eye-brain connection and its connections with other parts of the, sensor, of the sensory system and for that matter, the rest of the body. So it really makes sense for us now to talk a little bit about conceptually where we, where, where we started. Um, the biggest concept with all of the work that we do is that the visual system drives the motor system. And why this is important is most snow patients ask the same question. Is this my eyes? Is it my brain? Or is it both? And if we understand that developmentally, the eyes structurally are a part of the brain, therefore the eyes are the brain, therefore the real answer is both. And or, more accurately, likely, it's the pathways within the brain and the eyes that is the problem. Because we know already from all the testing that patients have had, structurally their eyes are quote unquote normal and their brain is quote unquote normal. So what we think we're working on within the work that we do is the pathways and the neural connections between the eyes and the brain. And one of the things that I felt like in working with athletes over the years is there's a concept in sports vision called the quiet eye. And basically what that means is what we're trying to do, if you're working with an athlete who has a, a, a field in front of them, fans in the, in the stands, things of that nature, what happens is, is that they are look, having to block out certain things, certain stimuli. And if we can make the eye work in a more quiet fashion, that they would get better. So I, I really felt like in talking to my visual snow patients that really what we were creating for them is a quieter input system which is what quieted down the, was gonna quiet down the symptoms of their visual snow. My name is uh, Susanna and I'm from uh, Paris, California. Soon after I had a baby, I actually ended up having a lot of uh, medical issues. And in um, June of 2020, I actually ended up uh, being prescribed a medication that ended up causing me central serous coronopathy, uh, which was basically a temporary loss of my left eye. I was really anxious, really overwhelmed by everything that was going on because I didn't, I didn't know, I thought that was going to be it. That's how it was going to be. I ended up having after images. I also developed tinnitus around that same time as well. And that's when I felt like, you know, I need to do something about this and get help. In October of 2020, I ended up um, meeting um, a fellow um, Visual Snow community member who ended up telling me about Dr. Stang. Soon I learned of all the work that she had done with all of the Visual Snow members. I actually ended up doing approximately 10 months of treatment with Dr. Sang. The ghosting was getting better. The after images were no longer overlapping. Um, I was no longer seeing the static during the day. Having had that opportunity to do the treatment um, just gave me that, the desire to continue in life. My name is uh, John Boyd. Uh, I'm 36 years old. I began developing visual snow symptoms around it's been a, about a decade it takes me uh, a lot longer to like sort of do things it sort of makes the edges and corners of like rooms and stuff kind of look like they're like moving and kind of appears as like a visual like distortion as well as a fair amount of um, like brain fog or cognitive fog i tried the you know 
like I guess the the classic route of you know cycling through anti antidepressants and stuff like that without much success. I found Dr. S from just Googling my symptoms and uh, that led me to the Visual Snow Initiative website. When I first started noticing a change in like my over, overall like perception, I guess, was when I started doing um, some work with the uh, in-office like prismatic lenses. Some other exercises that uh, involve um, like a swinging baseball on a string the world appeared quite like flat and kind of not very three-dimensional and those those things like really helped so the outcome with my treatment uh, with dr s is there's a noticeable like reduction in in my symptoms that seems to be holding before visual snow therapy um that like my bad periods would kind of go on indefinitely i i think overall across the board i've noticed like a permanent i would say 50 percent like reduction my message to like the visual snow community try not to to lose hope you know essentially is is very very important it has definitely worked for me so now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of jump into the neurology of vision and and i'm we're going to keep it short but I think the really important thing to do is really get a basic understanding of the visual system. And what we've learned is that there's really two visual pathways. There's the one we always think about um, that encompasses 80% of the signals from the retina. And that's the one that goes back to our visual cortex. So let's walk through that one first. Um, so light comes into the eye, the image comes into the eye and it goes to the retina. And um, from the retina, it goes through many say, layers of cells. Um, two most important layers that we'll talk about here are, everyone knows about rods and cones. Um, that helps us with color and versus dark vision. Uh, it gives us a lot of information about what we're seeing. But there's another group of cells called ganglion cells, and there's different types of ganglion cells that we look at. Uh, there's what we call magnocells and parvocells. And these cells are very, very important, and particularly for that secondary pathway that we're gonna talk about, because that secondary pathway is really where we think the problems are occurring. To jump for a second, all eye doctors, all doctors, all patients define vision, for the most part, as being a clarity system. And this is the first system that, um, that uh, Charles just mentioned, is this first pathway, the clarity system. The second system is what he's gonna talk about next. Right, and we're gonna talk about what we call the ambient pathway, which is the secondary pathway. But from, that, from the retina, the image will go on into the, what's called the lateral geniculate nucleus. And that's separated by those cell types, parvo and magnocellular. And so they get all separated in that, in that part of the system. And from there, it'll go on to the visual cortex for processing. So it's the main relay station between the retina and the visual cortex, th that particular structure. Um, and it's an early gatekeeper to control of visual intention and awareness. Um, and it helps coordinate visual information from, the from both the focal and ambient systems that I mentioned. And so once it gets to that visual cortex, um, then it goes to other areas of the brain for further processing. But the secondary pathway doesn't go directly that way. It goes through um, a part of the thalamus uh, called the superior, superior colliculus, or sometimes we call it the optic tectum. And it's a critical center for coordinating eye movements with the head and body. It enables us to have awareness of our surroundings. Uh, it allows us to find and fixate objects in regard. And it receives information from not only the visual system, but the auditory system, um, the spinal cord, the cerebellum. And it's important for, for eye movements, uh, particularly what we call saccadic eye movements, which are jump eye movements, what we use for reading, maintenance of fixation, uh, smooth visual pursuits, head turns. So these are very, very important part of the system. Um, and it also contributes to things like gravity and positioning, contrast, motion detection, and saccades. From there, it goes to another structure called the thalamic nucleus and the th uh, uh, pulvinar nucleus, the thalamic pulvinar nucleus. And that's, a, that's another really important structure in this because they, it, it does different things within that structure that are really, really important. 
Uh, it's important for initiation and compensation of a saccade, as well as the regulation of visual attention. And once again, with our visual snow patients, these are some of those common problems that we are seeing. We also have different nuclei controlling eye movements. There's 12 cranial nerves in the body, and at least half of them have some visual input, but there's three important ones we'll talk about. Uh, one's the ocular motor nerve, which is the third cranial nerve, the trochlear nerve, which is the fourth cranial nerve, and the abducens nerve, which is the sixth cranial nerve. And those three alone control all our eye movements. And since we felt like eye movements would, would be affected with this, and particularly those pursuit and saccadic eye movements, it's important to understand that these nerves are controlling uh, all those eye movements. And then from the spinal cord, we're getting integration of visual information through the proprioceptive and kinesthetic information from the rest of our body. And from there, it feeds back to, back to the visual cortex, and that's where it gets pushed out for further processing. So that, in the visual cortex, this is where we're determining color and contour and acuity and voluntary pursuits, and that's where our binocular vision system is based. And there are other brain structures also related. Uh, from there, it goes on to the frontal lobe, which is responsible for executive function. So initiation and goal planning, attention, emotion, uh, verbal expression, judgment, decision-making, expressive language. And then it also, some of it goes to the parietal lobe, which is language, uh, excuse me, uh, mapping. So that's where we map our, where we are in space. It helps us determine where we are in space. Tactile perceptions, awareness of body parts, uh, academic skills, object naming, and visual attention. And in the temporal lobe, that's where we have expressive and receptive language and sequencing and auditory and emotion and perceptual. So lots of different parts of the brains are involved in vision. So we don't want to just think of the visual cortex as being the main processor of vision. We want to think of all these other different parts of the brain are really affecting the, the ability to process things visually. So you take all that together, then we have to bring in the problem of what is visual snow and how is it affecting these structures. And what we really came to the conclusion of is that there's some sort of inflammatory process that's taking place. And we like, I like to call it neuroinflammation. What is this neuroinflammation? And what are the typical symptoms we see with neuroinflammation? Well, they can't handle motion, diff difficulty with movement, difficulty with sound or light, they can't focus. Um, oftentimes they have history of brain injury in the past, maybe a mild concussion, uh, migraine headaches, depression, and anxiety. So these are just common symptoms of neuroinflammation but yet these are also the common symptoms we see in visual snow. So we have to make the assumption that there's some connection between those two things. So when we break down the nervous system, everyone thinks about neurons being the, the, the manager of the nervous system. They're, they're the wires of the system they, and they make the connections. But once again, there's another part of the system that's really important too, and those are called glial cells. And you, believe it or not, glia means, in Latin means glue. That's the glue of the system. That's what holds the system together. Um, and this is what occurs for the other 90%. And, um, and actually 50% of the mass of the brain is made up of glial cells. So um, there's three basic types of glial cells, uh, oligodendrocytes, excuse me, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and microglia. And the oligodendrocytes, their job is to make up the white matter of the brain and, white, and the white matter of the visual system. The astrocytes have many roles. Um, they, they're very important in uh, permeability, but blood-brain barrier permeability. They release neural growth factors in response to injury. Um, so chronic neuroinflammation, is, uh, astrocytes are very involved with chronic uh, neuroinflammation. Uh, the last type is called microglia. And they're like macrophages. They're, they're, they're the immune system of the, of the nervous system. They fight infection. They're responsible for release of chemicals that can damage neurons. And they're scavengers of the nervous system. Now, what, these microglia are particularly interesting because they kind of look like starfish. And what happens is as they become activated, uh, as, in other words, you have a, an injury or you have a person who has depression or anxiety or any of these common symptoms that we see with visual snow, those microglia become activated and they go look from looking like a starfish to looking like an amoeba. So they lose their connections. This is the, this is the, the important part because they're supposed to connect to different parts of the nervous system. They lose that glue, if you will, that glue aspect, and they just kind of floating about and they're not, act, not, be, not being utilized quite as well. 
So you have those people with the mild neuroinflammation, what we call transient neuroinflammation. It's kind of like riding a bicycle uphill, okay? And then when it becomes more chronic, it's that hill steepens, okay? And then they get to a point where it, it becomes primed, where the system is really kind of losing its capabilities and you're, it's kind of an up and down road, okay? Sometimes they're, they're doing better, sometimes they're doing worse, and, and they kind of constantly go through that. In thinking about the study, and thinking about our patients, what we decided and realized was patients don't really care about clinical data and clinical numbers. What patients want to know is if they did neurovisual rehabilitation therapy, could their symptoms reduce and therefore their quality of life improve? So we decided to use a quality of life survey as our primary tool to see if before therapy and after therapy were there any changes and were those changes significant. When we decided to choose the tools for assessment, we really leaned on the anatomy and our understanding of the visual process um, when we chose the tools that we did. So let's first talk about the quality of life survey. It's the VFQ25 with 10 supplemental questions. And the subcategories included things such as general health, general vision, ocular pain, near activities, distance activities, social functioning, mental health, role difficulties, dependency, color vision, and peripheral vision. In the study design, all our patients completed an in-office assessment, which included electronic eye tracking, looking at pursuits, saccades, fixation. We also did balance testing with the cat sib, which gave us information about the vestibular role of vision, in the role of vision. We did a binocular visual assessment, we did a combinative visual assessment, we did the quality of life questionnaire, as well as some cognitive testing, either using the MOCA or the Cogniview. One thing about the balance test that's really important to understand is the way the test is designed, we're looking at both the, the sway and the center of balance for each individual. And then we break it down into the component parts of balance, which are vestibular, visual, and also um, touch or tactile. And so, and, we, and then the fourth measurement is all three, all three of those things together. So it's really important to understand we were looking at balance and seeing how we could change balance uh, utilizing some different tools that we have. Once patients were admitted into the study, um, as per the Western International Reboard Guidelines, patients were given a written consent form that was completed with the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, treatment itself consisted of 12 sessions of neurovisual rehabilitative therapy. Each session was 60 minutes in length. They were one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, each session consisted of three to five activities that we, based on our rehabilitative guide that we, Charles and I developed, we did a reassessment of the VFQ questionnaire at visit six, and then we did complete reassessment of all testing, including the VFQ 25 at visit 12. So our hypothesis statement for the study was, if visual snow syndrome patients completed neurovisual rehabilitation therapy, then their quality of life will improve. The null hypothesis was that neurovisual rehabilitation therapy has no effect on the quality of life measures for patients with visual snow syndrome. And the alternative hypothesis was that neurovisual rehabilitation therapy has an effect on the quality of life measures with visual snow syndrome. The statistical analysis that we used for this study was using a paired t-test. We chose a con confidence interval of 95%, which means that if the p-value was less than 0.5, then it was significant. It means that the differences between the two groups are unlikely to be due to chance, we can reject the null hypothesis and that the change is likely due to the intervention we applied, in this case, neurovisual rehabilitation therapy. So let's get to the results. The first score is a composite score. And from we chose to look at two separate times, pre-therapy to week six, and then pre-therapy to week 12. And part of the reason why we did this was in working with our own patients, we saw that there's some variability in results. So the, for most patients, the results are not linear, meaning um, improvement doesn't always happen in all the way straight fashion. Sometimes patients made a regression, so they got a little bit worse before they got better. So we were trying to see if there's a difference between week six values versus week 12 values and to see if we could quantify this in any sort of way. In essence, we expected to see some people would actually have worse symptoms 
moving into week six, and then we would get an improvement of symptoms thereafter. So the composite score includes everything together, and um, if you look at our slides, the p-value was less than 0 0.5. So from the beginning of therapy to six weeks of therapy, uh, we can say that this, the change in the score was st statistically significant. From baseline to week six, and also from baseline to week 12. The second category we talked about is general health. And if you look at the data, baseline to week six, the p-value was 0.97. And baseline to week six, to week 12, sorry, was 0.86, which means there was it's not statistically significant. And we kind of knew this would happen because we weren't assuming we were changing general health. For general vision, interestingly enough, from pre-test to pre-therapy to week six, the p-value was 0 0.06, which means it was not statistically significant. But from week pre-therapy to week 12, the p-value was 0 0.008, which means it was statistically significant. And I think this is a pretty important point here because you know most of these people had good acuity that we saw, but their perception of the changes in the vision area uh, with, with working with doing the neurovision rehabilitation all improved pretty significantly. The next category was ocular pain. And in both instances, week six and week 12, p-value was not less than 0 0.05. Therefore, there was, it's not statistically significant. And part of the thing is we notice with most visual snow patients, they don't complain of pain to begin with. That's not really one of their major symptoms. So again, it's not surprising there wasn't much change. With respect to near activities, both at week six and at week 12, the, it, was, it was statistically significant uh, for change. Same thing with distance activities. It was statistically significant both at week six and week 12. Social functioning also, statistically significant week six and week 12. And I found this was a really important point as well because um, a lot of them almost become, they get locked in their own homes. They, get, they, they, they don't interact with their community. They're afraid to go out. And just improving that quality of life, this is such a big part of improving that quality of life, is improving that social functioning. Mental health, statistically significant both at week six and week 12. Role difficulty, again, statistically significant week six and week 12. Dependency, statistically significant week six and week 12. And once again, another important point here, because many of them, for the first visit, they would come, someone would drive them to the visit. They can't drive, um, they can't go work, they couldn't work, they couldn't sit in front of a computer, um, they couldn't go to the, to the supermarket. So they were all really, really struggling with these things and they were requiring, uh, they, they needed someone else to help them along. And really within a few weeks, we were seeing that they weren't requiring, that people were driving themselves to our offices, which was really a cool thing to see. Color vision, not statistically significant for either week six or week 12, and either was peripheral vision. So interesting for me, we talk a lot about, you know, we think there's issues between the central visual system and peripheral visual system, and the relationship between that, which causes lots of issues. That all looks incredible. And now that we've seen your protocol, can you take us through the actual results of your study? So my first patient was, uh, one of the cases I'm gonna present is a patient who is a 36 year old Hispanic female. She had lots of visual symptoms when I first met her, uh, including trailing lights. She described images that persist. She would say that if she looked at her baby and then she looked at her husband, the baby's head would be on her husband's head. She said she had lots of after images that were so bad that they all would overlap. Her car lights would stuck on her vision when she drove so she couldn't drive anymore. The sky was shimmery like electricity. White walls also so shimmery she couldn't see the wall very clearly. If she looked at her hand, she would see an extra oar or an extra double hand. Sometimes she'd look at her husband's head and she'd see two of them. Um, she had shaky vision all the time. Her night vision was very grainy, not quite static, but quite always very grainy. And then she noticed if she covered one eye or then the other, the static was very increased, kind of like an analog TV. She also, she was one of my patients who described extreme stress prior to the onset of symptoms. She had also experienced H. pylori gastrointestinal infections, and she was on three types of different antibiotics prior to the onset of symptoms. She then developed central serous retinopathy. She had no history of psychoactive drug use. She was a mother of three children, but she was unable to work or drive and was become very dependent on her husband to do all the household chores. 
interesting enough, central serous retinopathy tends to occur in patients who are stressed. So it's definitely related to, it's definitely a stress-related symptom, and it actually causes a reduction of visual acuity. For her, visual findings, key visual findings was she had reduced accommodation, she had very reduced ocular motor skills, she had reduced binocular findings and reduced cognitive skills. Her visual acuity in her central serous eye was actually quite strong, so that had largely recovered, but many of her other visual skills were very, very reduced. Within the testing, I'm going to show you, we did a balance testing, we did electronic eye tracking, and the treatment that we prescribed was neurovisual neuro rehabilitation therapy with the use of both lenses and prisms and the movement therapy that we prescribed. So you can see here, this is our electronic eye tracking um, display, and what this test measures, uh, when the patient looks, it's a screen-based measure, so looking at a computer screen, and uh, they're looking at a little dot that kind of either moves in a circular pattern or in a horizontal pattern or an up and down pattern in a smooth pursuit kind of way. It also measures the way the eyes can jump from one target to another, both presented in a horizontal fashion as well as an up and down fashion. But what it gives us when we're reading the data is it gives us individual um, data about each eye individually. And in this case, there are seven measurements per second. So in a very short amount of time, it really detects movement on a very micro level. So you can see in the picture here that her right eye ability compared to left eye ability was significantly different, both for pursuits, saccades, and for even fixation. I think it's important to also look at the scale here. Um, there, there's a scale at the top where green is, means they have good skill. Yellow means it's somewhat reduced. Orange would be a significant, a significant decrease in that skill, and red would be a very poor skill. And so each measurement or each area is measured either as uh, red, orange, yellow, or green. And then you'll see a little box at the upper right-hand corner uh, in, on the scale, and that's where normal for her age would be. And then you could see where she scaled out. Uh, ultimately, she scaled out in the red uh, because there is such a difference between her two eyes. When you look at the balance test, you can see that within the first four bars is the conditions that we assess, both eyes open and eyes closed, which looks at vision and then also vestibular and proprioceptive system. And you can see that proprioceptive system um, has a, certainly a very impacted um, sway, very impacted measure. We then apply different lenses and different uh, prisms to see if we could impact that system. And so when we did that, we use those, we use that information within the therapy to strengthen and improve. So here's our week 12 data. And what was so fun with this patient was I had done the testing and brought her back and showed her the testing. And she said to me that she wished that her eyes looked like this. And then I revealed that actually this was her eyes. And um, the symptoms that we had reduced for her matched many of the data that we collected within this testing. So she was delighted to realize this was her eyes because it was the eyes that she had hoped for. So fun. Mm -hmm. Key findings, she had improved accommodation, she had improved, improved ocular motor skills, she had improved binocular findings, and her cognitive skills were also improving. When we looked at the balance testing as well, balance testing also were more baseline normal. So overall, she was feeling better and we were showing clinical data to prove that she was also, that matched her symptoms. And that's what's important about doing objective tests. She can report improvement in these skills, but sometimes at that, that doesn't match exactly what you're seeing when it comes down to objective testing. But in this case, the objective testing certainly mimicked what we're, she was seeing subjectively. So the study officially ended after 12 visits, but she was doing so well that she decided she wanted to see if she could get more improvement. So she continued for another 12 weeks, and this is the data from the, the next 12 weeks after 24 weeks of therapy. And you can see that all her scores have improved, the ability for both, her both eyes working together improved, and uh, symptom-wise, more importantly, she reported that when she had persistent image, images of her child's face on her, on her husband's face, no longer, she was no longer having that symptom. Uh, the after images that used to overlap no longer had that symptom. Car lights stuck in her vision, they were rarely happening, it was reduced by 90%. The shimmery sky electric, like electricity no longer existed. The shimmery walls no longer existed. The second image of her hand, 95% gone. 
the shaky vision. She said maybe she noticed it at night, but during the day, 90% gone. Her nighttime grainy vision, she said even at the worst time, she used to see almost like fire, and now she says 80%, no more. Light sensitivity, none. And her static with one eye covered, so very faint, it didn't bother her anymore. She described um, her symptoms like this. The accommodation, because now she knew what accommodation was, is. Her accommodation is now 90% 90, 90 improved. Her reaction time is so much faster. There's no more lag in her vision when she moves her eyes from one place to another. When she's tired, her symptoms do increase, but when she's not tired, she virtually has no more symptoms. Her ghosting 90, has a 90% reduction. She can go shop, and when she looks at signs, there's no more floating words. She has trailing if she looks for it, but it doesn't really bother her. She's driving again. When she moves her eyes from dashboard to billboard, again, there's no lag. She's able to drive normally. And more, more importantly, she's been able to go back to work. So if she does a lot of computer work, then maybe she's aware of her after images, but she's gone back to work. She's taking care of her family. She has improved emotionally in many ways as well. So my case was a 27-year-old Asian female. Um, her visual snow symptoms were static over the entire visual field. It was worse in the dark. Um, she had floaters. She had palinopsia. She had nyctalopia, which means nighttime vision was affected. Uh, she had vertigo, pattern glare, starbursts around lights, photophobia, warping walls and objects. So things actually seemed distorted to her. Um, altered death perception, uh, occasional tinnitus, occasional tingling in the extremities, and neck and shoulder pain. Some of our comorbidities, she had migraine headaches. They were long standing, um, uh, but she also had potentially um, concussion issues, which may or may not be a factor. So she had concussion many, many years ago, so she was wondering if that potentially was a factor. She was also suffering from depression. Uh, she had no history of psychoactive drug use. Um, other uh, his, history factors include static it was worse when she would wake up and, and when she would go to sleep. She had done some chiropractic work and she had done some nutritional supplements, which seemed to help her some. Um, her key visual findings, uh, similar to Dr. Sang's case, decreased accommodation, reduced depth perception, visual spatial disorientation, uh, a mildly reduced doctor motor skill, uh, although not as significant as, as Dr. Sang's patient, reduced neurocognitive skills. Um, so we, we went through and did some neurosensory testing. Uh, we did the cat balance test, uh, we did electronic eye tracking, and we also did a neurocognitive test that we'll discuss. So our treatment recommendations, we decided to do uh, a very similar, in a similar matter using passive and active therapy, that is using lenses, prisms, tints, maybe some occlusions to help her uh, with, with her processing ability, and then do the neurovision rehabilitation program uh, that we described. On this first slide, I'm going to show you the balance test. And you can see here, um, primarily, uh, most of her balance skills were pretty good except for vestibular. They were really, really elevated. However, when we used some neurotherapeutic lenses, we did see a significant improvement in the vestibular balance component. On the uh, electronic eye tracking, um, she was, uh, as I described it before with, with Dr. Sang, um, when you're in the orange, that means you're significantly reduced. And both her pursuit movements, which are the smooth eye movements, that's like um, watching a car go down the street or watching a tennis ball. That's a smooth eye movement. Those were significantly reduced. Um, Saccadic eye movements is jump movement. So if I look from one object to the other object, how do I do? What do we use that skill for? We use it for reading. Okay, and that was also in that significantly reduced range. And her fixations were kind of in that moderate range, so they're somewhat, somewhat reduced. Um, and so we definitely had a look at, at that. And then we did the cognitive, and the test I use is called a, a Cogniview. It's a five minute neurocognitive test, a very, very simple test, but it looks at uh, different types of memory skills. So you have overall memory, you have visual spatial memory, and then you have executive function, which comes from the frontal lobe of the brain. And uh, in, in, her, in her initial measurement of memory, she scored a 57, which is kind of in that moderate ability level. Uh, on her visual spatial memory, though, she did very well, scoring a 94. And her executive function, she scored a 74, which is getting into that moderate level also. Uh, and this is a very, very bright person. And I think uh, actually one of the things Dr. Sang and I have talked about, it was, seems really interesting, but many of these patients are high intelligence. So 
the fact that they seemed high intelligence, but they were also suffering, potentially suffering some cognitive dysfunction was very, very interesting to us. And we wanted to see if we can actually change that because it's not, it's more of a direct reflection of what we do in, in vision rehabilitation uh, more than anything we do directly. Um, and uh, we also, the other things that this test tests as well as reaction time and processing speed, which uh, she did pretty well with both of those skills. So once again, we, we did our 12 sessions on neurovision rehabilitation. She did her passive therapy as well. And now after those sessions, her depth perception was normal. Her ocular motor skills had significantly improved. Her accommodation was normal and her symptom levels had improved dramatically. When we look at the testing, we do the look at the balance testing. Everything was very stable with balance. Um, she still had some vestibular balance issues which, which we needed to work on. Um, when we looked at the right eye test uh, or, the, or the electronic eye tracking test, she had significantly improved um, in all, all ways. She went from the orange area to the yellow on pursuits and saccade and her fixations had gone from uh, the low yellow zone all the way to the green zone. She, in fact, she scored a 90 on fixation. So her ability to, to, to lock in and fixate on something had really, really improved significantly. On her cognitive test, her memory went, score went from 57 to 83. Uh, so to the good zone, even her, her good skill, which was her, um, her visual spatial skill went from 94 all the way to 97. You can only get 100, so that was pretty good. And then um, executive function had gone from uh, 74 to 86 in just 12 weeks. Um, and processing speed also improved. So those are really, really nice findings. So going, jumping into, she actually was really nice enough to share a whole spreadsheet of pre-symptoms and post-symptoms with me. So I'm gonna share that with you. And the first thing uh, was a visual symptom of floaters and they were, and they were uh, large and present uh, in all lighting situations. And after therapy was over with, they were tiny uh, uh, and, and very minimally noticed. Uh, her after images went from, uh, you know, uh, 15 minutes of bright reflections, um, constant, uh, debilitating, TV was a big problem for her and only, only occasional at that point in time. Her after images were constant um, uh, and went from constant to rare. Um, her her uh, peripheral vision issues, uh, flickering in the peripheral vision was nearly constant and it was totally resolved. Um, breathing walls, what she calls breathing walls were constant and, and they were totally resolved. Um, uh, I think there were dry eyes. She actually was having constant dry eyes because she wasn't blinking a whole lot, I think, was really the reason she was having it. And that had totally resolved as well. Uh, brain fog. Uh, and we, we mentioned that once again, one of the main um, elements of neuroinflammation is brain fog. And she had a constant amount of brain fog, which had, had maybe gone to the point where it was just occasional. Um, migraine headache, she was having five to seven times per week and guess what? No migraine headaches anymore. So that was really fun to see. Um, uh, and there's a whole list of snow and static was constant and now it was totally resolved. So by and large, most of her symptoms had improved quite significantly from where she was when she started. Well, I think from, from this point in time, um, th there are some other therapies that can be integrated with the neurooptometric rehabilitation therapy. Um, some, some things that Terry and I have discussed is what's the role of nutrition in this whole thing? Um, can we use things like guided imagery uh, or binaural beats to kind of uh, help the people, especially with depression and anxiety? To, will that help some of their symptoms? Uh, different relaxation techniques, um, low level laser, um, there's a, tech, a technique, uh, brain techniques using low level laser. We're wondering if, if that will have an impact on it. Sound modulation therapy, where we can maybe impact the tinnitus a little bit more. And then also looking at things like genetics, because um, when you do genetic testing, especially nutrigenomics, there are certain um, genes in our system that make us super, uh, make us to have much more inflammation or they, it turns on inflammation much more rapidly or having difficulty turning off inflammation becomes really important. Um, there's also factors in genetics that make you more susceptible to be having depression and anxiety. So what are those little pieces, what are, are those pieces playing a role in who is getting
visuals, no symptoms. Within the study, the treatment included 12 sessions of neurovisual rehabilitation. Each session was 60 minutes in length. They were one-on-one -on -one sessions. Each session consisted of three to five activities based on our rehabilitative guide that we developed. We did a reassessment of the VFQ25 at visit six, and then we did a complete reassessment of all testing, including the VFQ25 also at visit 12. Before we hear more about your study, I'm sure there's lots of people that want to know what does the neurovision rehabilitation therapy actually involve? So we're gonna head to your offices to find out more. Let's take a look. Welcome to my office. Now I'm gonna show you some of the therapeutic techniques that we use for patients who have visual snow syndrome. This is just a reminder that the therapy is tailor-made for each patient and how I determine what needs to be done is through the assessment. So while all visual snow patients may have similar symptoms, the challenge is visually when we do our assessments, the underlying issues that they're having vary from patient to patient. It's been my experience that no visual snow syndrome patient has exactly the same visual issues. So when I design a therapeutic program, I work with the knowledge that I have and I develop a program in a particular order so I can rehabilitate the system in an appropriate way. So this is not DIY therapy, it is not do it yourself, and I'm not encouraging you to try this at home. This activity is uh, with the use of yoked prisms, the purpose of which is to expand visual space. Uh, visual system and motor system work hand in hand, so we, during therapy, we do all sorts of things to help understand visual space in different ways. Please step on the balance beam and I'll have you walk along the beam. And as she's walking on the beam, just pay attention to how balanced she is, how comfortable she is, where she is looking. If we change visual regard, does it change the way she is able to maintain her balance? So now I'm gonna have her put on some prisms. And uh, again, the purpose of this is to change her visual experience as she's looking with these lenses. Everything looks taller. She feels taller. So I love these glasses, <laughs> but really its purpose is to just change her visual space and see how it affects her motor system. So this exercise is called four chart wall saccade. So she's gonna start off by saying the first letter in the top corner of one chart. She'll jump to the same position of the second chart, to the same position of the third chart, to the same position of the fourth chart. And then she'll go to the next letter, second position, second position. You'll notice this particular chart that I have, have both letters and colors. So to add another level of challenge, I'm gonna have her first say the letter names on the first run. The second trial she'll go through colors. The third one she'll go back to letters. The fourth one she'll go back to colors. So for some patients, these activities are quite easy. So we have ways to increase level, adding balance, adding rhythm, adding motion uh, for each activity. So every activity has different levels. So this is another therapeutic technique that we use using a tool called the Benovi Touch. So it is a tool that is automated and uh, we have patients run through different programs. I'll give you one example. We use this oftentimes to help increase awareness of the peripheral visual system. So in this particular example, um, our patient's gonna be looking at the central target. She'll keep her focus there the entire time. Off to the side, she'll notice that there are colored dots that are illuminated and she has to push the button as fast as she can. In this example, I have her on a balance board for increased challenge. As well, I'm gonna have her use alternating hands as she does this activity. This next activity is called Vectos. And Vectos is a great activity that helps us understand how the two eyes work together. And when the two eyes work together, it really gives us a visual system understanding of visual spatial awareness. She's wearing special glasses and we have special filters. And as she does this activity, um, she is going to be looking at the targets. I'll be walking her through to tell her what she sees and I'll be manipulating the targets so that we can help her understand where she is spatially. This next activity uses the SVI uh, Sanit Vision Integrator and we're working on uh, eye movement particularly pursuit skills in this case. And the goal with this activity is a central peripheral task. She is going to pick any dot, and I want you to look at the dot, follow it one full rotation. I want you to actually take your finger and hover over the dot that you're looking at. And when you get to the 12 o'clock position, I want you to go ahead and touch the dot, which will make it go away. If, as you're doing it, you notice using your side vision that the central target letter changes, then I want you to touch that central letter. This activity is called uh, Flipper Focus, and the purpose of the activity is to increase the eye's ability to either uh, 
positively accommodate or negatively accommodate. The lenses come in different powers and as the patient is doing the task, we are flipping the lenses so her lens has to respond in an efficient, quick manner. We always start this activity patched. So I'll have you start reading um, across. And when I put the lens in front of your eye, I want you to start when the letters are clear. Tell Carrie Round Farmer picture. This is called binocular flipper focus. So when we're building or rehabilitating the accommodative system, we always will start one eye at a time to make sure that each eye is equally strong. Using a filter system like this, red-green filters and with red-green glasses. So as she reads across, tell me, um, are any of the lines going dark? Yes. Which ones are going dark? The green ones now. What happens if you tap the page? What happens if you blink? They're, they do lighten up. The way we use this activity is we uh, increase power. As her ability increases, we increase power. So she's able to uh, shift focus with both eyes open together. We use many different ways to increase visual system and cognitive processing. This is just one of the games that we use. It's called the matrix. In this particular activity, she's going to sequence the letters of the alphabet. She's going to pick up the first letter in white, and she's going to uh, land it on the open color. She'll say the letter that she picks up, and she'll let say the color that she lands on. She's doing visual scanning. She's visual through your ground. She's doing motor planning. Super complex skill doing this activity. Thanks for joining me today in my office. Now let's go take a look what Charles has in his office for you. Our first procedure we're gonna to show today is four chart saccades on a balance beam. What we have here are these charts on, on the blackboard here. So what we'll typically have them do is read one letter off each chart. That's a good basic, act, what we call saccadic eye movement activity. And, but it also works on spatial skills because you're having to discern where the word is on, on each of the squares. To make it more challenging though, uh, we bring in a balance board and they have to go heel to toe on the balance board moving backward and forward while they're reading the four chart saccades. Next activity is central peripheral saccades. Saccadic eye movement is a jump movement or a ballistic movement uh, moving your eyes between two points. One of the things we do here is we can draw this little X on the chalkboard here and what the person does is they'll, they'll trace out to the middle of the circle. They'll go from the X to the circle and touch it in the, in the middle. Um, so it's a really good training to smooth out eye movements uh, and saccadic eye movements in particular. This next procedure is called vectorgrams and vectorgrams are really kind of a unique uh, activity because what we're doing is we're working on developing uh, binocular vision skills. We have the individual wearing some polarized glasses and we have these polarized targets and we start to separate the targets and as we separate it the image will move toward them or away from them um, and I think it's really, really helpful for them in the later stages of therapy, we will utilize this to um, really develop those, the strength of that binocular vision system. This next procedure uh, is called flippers. And the reason we get its name is we use these little flippers and they have different powers in them and we can progressively increase and decrease the powers as we go along. And we use a specialized chart in this particular case. We're using a chart that has red and white. And our subject here is wearing red and green lenses. So the red will typically see the red and green will typically see the green. And then she's using power to, to stimulate focus and to destimulate focus. This activity is called multi-matrix. And the, what makes it really unique is that there's hundreds of games within the game. But we can work on utilizing letters and numbers and, and combinations. We can do shapes and sizes and we can create a variety of different games where they have to um, do some matching activities and some mixing activities for all the all these different uh, variable different cubes. This next activity is called the Sanit Vision Integrator and what happens is um, all some letters and numbers will rotate in a circle and the individual have to tap out the, the numbers uh, in order but all at the same time this is rotating in a big circle so it really helps us develop on the skills of latency, velocity and accuracy. The next activity is called prism walks. And what we do is we have the individual wearing these prism lenses and we can change the orientation of the prism. And what that does, it might, to the patient, it might appear like they're going downhill or uphill or slightly to the right or slightly to the left. 
but really what it's doing is expanding their visual space. And we'll have them walk. We may have them walk a pattern on the floor, or we can have them on a walking rail, and they can walk on the walking rail uh, and look at a, an eye chart. It really forces them to open up their periphery and utilize their, their peripheral vision in a much more effective way. The next procedure is called VTS4. And what this is, is a, a computer program that has a variety of different activities uh, for an individual to do. And what's unique about it is it's on a 3D TV and you have to wear 3D glasses for these procedures. It's a really, really effective tool so that we can uh, train the visual system to be more efficient and more effective. The next one is called Binobi Touch. And Binobi Touch is a light board. And they go on the light board and a light pattern will light up and they'll touch the pattern as it, as it lights up. And we can do things like reaction time, pro-action time, probably about 20 different activities we can do on the Binobi Touch board that can really help that visual system become much more efficient. Thank you both so much for being here and sharing with us the details of your study and what you've been working on for the past year and a half. For those who would like more information about the VSI, please visit visualsnowinitiative.org. You can also follow us on social media for updates and more. My name is Joshua Cornwall, and I am from San Gabriel, California. It all started around two years ago. Suddenly these dots just started appearing in my vision. And I thought, okay, maybe I better try and sleep. And I got to sleep, but when I woke up, the floaters were still there, and that made me panic a lot. So I had to go to the ER. They didn't know what happened. Went to the eye doctor. They didn't know what happened. Had an MRI. They can't explain it. No doctor could explain what was going on. No one really like took it seriously until uh, my mom Googled visual snow and finding about Dr. Sang through the internet. And she's uh, the first one to believe me and actually help. My name is Carrie Cornwall. I'm from San Gabriel, California, and Josh is my son. We just kept trying to find out what was wrong with him. We went to eye doctors. They couldn't find anything. We went to various specialists, ophthalmologists, retina specialists. He was very depressed. Uh, he wouldn't come out of his room. He wouldn't, he was just miserable. Finally, I just got on the internet trying to figure out what was wrong with him. And that's where we ended up with Dr. Sang and said that she could get him in on this clinical study to try. The treatments were a lot like physical therapy just for your eyes. I could actually feel my eyes like exercising, like they, it felt like they went for a run. The results of the treatment are definitely like showing I could not see this well two years ago. I garden, I walk my dog, I play with my cat, I hang out with my friends, and I do things I'm able to enjoy now. I never thought I would get to this point because I was, I felt I was at rock bottom. I felt I couldn't live a normal life. If you think you have visual snow syndrome, you have to get treatment for it. You have to try it. My son is living proof. He's just completely turned around and a much happier person. Every other doctor had given up on me, basically, but Dr. Sang did not. And that is what I needed. That is what people with visual snow need. And now let's get to the Q&A portion of our presentation. These questions were submitted by the VSS community. What specific visual or non-visual symptoms improved with the study? Well, I think uh, what we saw was we saw an improvement in many symptoms. But once again, treatment has been individualized and, and, and there was a variation uh, among, uh, among what was improved for each individual person. Um, I think what we learned is it kind of followed a bell curve. Um, we had about 10% that had fully resolved symptoms and about 80%, they still had some symptoms of snow, but as we explained with our, our two uh, individuals that we showed, um, most of their symptoms were significantly improved. They can, they can do more things in their lives. They, they, they were much more active and, and things of that nature. And there was about 10% that really didn't have much improvement. So I think that's kind of a fair way to think about it. What was the average time before improvement occurred? We saw improvement as early as six weeks. Again, it wasn't always linear. Sometimes patients made improvements and then they had a little bit of a setback and then they started to improve again. But generally around six weeks, we could see change. 
Um, by 12 weeks, that was the end of our study design. I think that sometimes it was um, mis uh, misconstrued that they would be absolutely completed by 12 weeks, but that really wasn't our intention. It was to show that change could happen by 12 weeks and then patients had the option to continue if they felt that symptom reduction was significant enough to continue. Is there any correlation between patient success and how long they had VSS? We certainly didn't find any. Um, we had patients who had VSS for 20 plus years, and we had patients who had developed it in the last few months. And uh, all, in each case, we, we saw improvement. Did you discover any specific treatments that reduce specific symptoms? I don't think we were able to co make that correlation. Symptom reduction varied between patients, so I don't think we're able to make those kind of conclusions. I would agree with that. Did anyone's VSS go away entirely? Yes, as we mentioned, we, we did have about 10% of um, the, the individuals in the study go away entirely. And certainly in the case of Michael, who I described at the beginning, who was my first VSS patient, he had 100% reduction, uh, reduction of symptoms. Symptoms and severity of these symptoms are different in everyone. Did you find a common thread in symptoms of patients in your study? I think anxiety was very common was a common thread in all of our patients. What were the ages of the patients in your study? The age range was between nine and 60. Once the study concluded, did the improvement last in people who had reduced VSS symptoms? To this point, we, we, the, the results seemed to be lasting. I just saw someone back yesterday who is three months out and everything is very stable. Um, and we expect, because we changed the brain ultimately, um, we expect these, uh, the changes to be permanent. What part of your study do you believe is an actual reduction of visual snow symptoms and what part is the placebo effect? It's very difficult to separate uh, the placebo effect from, from the actual study results. I think it's the repetition of this happening over and over and over again. Plus when you do statistical analysis, that's why we use that 95% number um, who are seeing a symptom improvement because that's supposed to eliminate uh, the placebo effect as, as a major factor. Please explain what you believe the pathophysiology to be that occurs within your treatment. So we know that structurally the eyeballs are fine. We know that structurally the brain is fine. What we believe is happening is something between the communication pathways within the visual pathways. We also think potentially there's perhaps mild inflammation, whether chronic or new, that is affecting these pathways. Did any of the participants of your study get worse? I think what we saw is that there, there was a very small percentage who didn't get better, but no one really got worse. Now, they may have gotten worse for a time period, as we've already explained, what would, would happen is sometimes symptoms got worse at first, and then they, then they started elevating it as they went through the um, neurovision rehabilitation. How long was the VSS study? From conception to completion, about a year and a half. Do you have recommendations for people who go through treatment to maintain their improvement? Patients now have the skill set, so if their symptoms come back, they now have the tools to help rehabilitate their visual system. The real key in therapy is we want to give patients, get the patients to a point where they are in control. And that's kind of where we leave them off, is when, they're, when we feel like they have control. So if symptoms do crop up, they know, as, as Dr. Sang mentioned, they have the tools that they know what they can do to kind of minimize their symptoms. For those who don't live in the US, how can they get your treatment? I think what's gonna happen ultimately is we, our plan is to go ahead and teach uh, optometrists and ophthalmologists and neurologists, wherever they are in the world, we're gonna, we are planning on going teaching a certification course in uh, neurovision rehabilitation for visual snow syndrome. And once they, we, we roll out the certification course for, uh, uh, for these practitioners, then we expect that everyone in the world can get treated. For any doctors out there who would like to be in the VSI's physician directory, can you please provide an email address for inclusion? Yes. Please email daisy at visualsnowinitiative.org. And finally, what do you want the medical community to know that they may not have known before about VSS? Well, I think, I think, I think the simple answer is there, are, there is a treatment that's out there that can be beneficial to these patients who are struggling with VSS. I think it's also really important that we de develop a 
criteria for physicians to diagnose VSS because I think a lot of people are walking around with these symptoms that don't even realize that they have VSS. So hopefully now that there is some sort of treatment for it, it's gonna prompt us to be able to, to be better diagnose um, visual snow syndrome. Thank you so much, Dr. S and Dr. Sang. Are there any final words that you would like to share with our audience today? I would like to say thank you for the opportunity to provide some help. And I'd like to thank everyone. Um, I think it's, it's outstanding that we have found some solutions. I think we're gonna be able to help a lot of people. I think we're also gonna discover a lot of people out there who, who really have symptoms um, and they wanna talk about it because I think there's a lot of people that don't even talk about their symptoms right now because they think they're crazy. So I think ultimately what I'm hoping will happen is just the awareness of this uh, syndrome will become much more relevant and knowing that there's some sort of treatment out there that can help them. The VSI would like to thank you for watching. For those in our audience that would like to watch this presentation again or share with others, please go to visualsnowinitiative.org. For more information and Visual Snow resources, please visit our website. You can also follow VSI on social media for more updates. We appreciate you being here and thanks again for watching.